Welcome to lecture number three. <laughs> Glad that you joined us and that you're doing well in the class. You're kind of settling in and learning how to use your study guide and so on. So today we're going to be talking about um, some things that are not necessarily in your book to kind of give you a perspective of uh, history and um, uh, putting all of the different bits together uh, in a sense. And strangely enough, we're going to talk uh, a bit about the Romans. So you've heard of the Roman Empire that existed for a thousand years uh, back uh, from, let's say, four or five hundred BC until about 400 AD. And this um, was a city state that became an empire that took over almost all of the known world at that point. It went from uh, Egypt to North Africa through uh, what's now known as Israel, Palestine, Syria, uh, up through uh, all of Europe, all the way eventually through England uh, up to Scotland. And in Scotland, they built a wall called Hadrian's Wall because they didn't want to mess with those Scots. So it went from Scotland all the way down to Egypt. And this um, uh, empire uh, has a huge impact on later what happened not only in Europe, but really North America. And the book doesn't talk about that very much. The lady who wrote the book um, includes an awful lot of detail uh, that she has gathered about Native American peoples, um, but doesn't necessarily either have the background in the history or doesn't include it because the book is already so huge. All right. So what kinds of things that have to do with the Latin uh, Romans that uh, might impact what happened in uh, Southeast U.S. for the Native American people. For one thing, uh, the idea of owning property. So uh, in the Roman times and then later all through Europe, uh, people have this idea that you can own land. An individual can own land, the church can own land, uh, the government or state can own land. And the idea that it just sort of belongs to everybody and the great spirit or God uh, gave it to all, everyone to share and you don't own a particular part of it, that didn't make any sense at all to them. So instead, as soon as they could, each person would want to get some land, uh, just as you might want an apartment, condo, house, or even country property if you can afford it. Uh, that's what the Europeans thought when they came to America. And so when they were first exploring, they weren't necessarily immediately looking for farms. So you've read about uh, the French traders, the English traders, the Dutch traders, the Spanish traders, uh, they're usually the first ones in to a new frontier. And they want to try to trade things that are not necessarily expensive where they come from, for example, metal objects, buttons, clothing items. And they want to exchange that for things that are more exotic or special. And in Americas, uh, the furs were very special at first, and they would be taken back and made into fur coats, but also uh, stylish hats. So they would take beaver skin, for example, and they could make it into these really nifty, expensive hats, and it was very profitable. And so that went on for 50 years, 100 years, depending on the location, with not much impact on the Native people, other than uh, the Native people were sometimes, some tribes would become a little bit more aggressive and steal furs and so on from other tribes. But generally, it just meant that it was an extra source of income and it was a way of getting some cool new things like knives made out of metal instead of stone. Um, and eventually uh, guns where you could shoot an animal from much further away than you could if you were trying to shoot with a bow and arrow or uh, catch it with a spear or a trap, that kind of thing. Uh, and if you had enemies, uh, you could shoot them with these guns. So some tribes, as you've read about, uh, were able to use the guns as weapons. So that trading went on for quite some time. And the languages the people were speaking, uh, Spanish, Portuguese, uh, Dutch, uh, Germanic languages, uh, English, French, those are all languages which are directly tied to Latin. Because when Roman Empire took over all these countries, they took the native languages and uh, the people would uh, slightly change them to fit Latin words. So that's why in Spanish and English, for example, doctor is spelled the same and there's lots of words that if you look at French or German that you could make out what does this word mean if you're reading it 
uh, because it's fairly close to the English words and all of them uh, related through the Romance languages or Latin back to Rome. Other ideas from Rome were that um, the men uh, were in control of the family and the control of the state. So women didn't have much public, uh, you know, as, as far as a public presence in, in ruling uh, in Latin America, in, sorry, in Rome. And of course, through the Latin countries and through the rest of Europe. Uh, the idea that the man is the head of the house and basically in charge, that kind of idea uh, that the author mentions many times about patrilineal, uh, male-dominated society, these kinds of phrases, some of which uh, are a little bit value-laden on, on her part. Those uh, are traditionally the way things were done in Europe. And when Christianity came along, uh, it fit, Christianity of Europe fit into that kind of mindset. And so, uh, and some of the, the teachings from the Bible um, have those same ideas. So when you have these Europeans, Spanish, French, English, Dutch, it's, a, you know, from culture to culture, it's different, but there are these same kind of ideas, private land ownership, male dominance, uh, that kind of thing. Another thing from the Latins was the idea, uh, or the Romans, uh, is the idea that the army would be a well-organized unit. So the army that the Romans had could not be beat by anyone. The only time they had a very significant defeat was in Germany when, uh, half of their army was killed, 25,000 people all at once, because the Germanic tribes were very warlike. They surrounded them and they killed them. Uh, but that was very unusual. Normally what would happen is that Romans would line up in a line with shields, uh, but with highly trained men with uh, swords and javelins and uh, a kind of slingshot that would throw lead and all kinds of uh, other warlike devices. And they were able to overcome in time uh, all the different tribes throughout Europe. And uh, this highly organized, massive group of professional soldiers was something that Native American people didn't do. Um, and as you've read about in the East, and now you'll be reading about in the Southeast, uh, Native Americans typically would have a not so much a war as a raid. And it, it was a feud, where, you know, ongoing feud between families or between neighboring tribes, where somebody, for whatever reason, at the very beginning, which could have been a thousand years ago, killed somebody. And then the other tribe comes back and kills somebody. And then they go back and forth, back and forth for hundreds of years, where they'll kill someone, usually, according to the text, uh, they would be some sort of a ambush. So they know this person's going along this trail. There's only two or three of them. They'll run in and kill one of them. Uh, and then maybe they'll capture some family members of that person uh, and take them back and make them into either slaves or occasionally they'll adopt them if they need replacement children because they've died or something like that. So very small scale, not um, even though there might be a warrior culture, not a soldier kind of culture. So then when you'll be reading about Soto, who had taken over Peru and brought back lots of gold to Spain, when he decided to go through uh, the whole Southeast, practically halfway across America over four years, he had 600 soldiers. He had weapons that were the kind that Native Americans have never heard about or seen before, uh, such as guns, uh, had horses. People had never seen horses before in North America. Um, so that was very frightening to see these people up on horses. Uh, there were 600 of them and they would storm in and uh, people would either run away, give up. Uh, they really weren't directly confronting these Spanish soldiers. Eventually some tribes tried to fight with them. And in one case were able to kill a uh, couple hundred of the Spaniards, but then they lost uh, maybe a thousand or more of their soldiers or their braves. So, you know, it's, it was kind of a one-sided thing, uh, mostly, uh, and it's how, where did they learn how to become soldiers? Well, Spain used to be part of Roman Empire, and they learned how to be soldiers then, and they never forgot about how to become soldiers. They just added better weapons, and they've had uh, horses for thousands of years, so they know how to use them to fight. Um, and uh, the 
so what, what was the big idea about Roman Empire? A lot of the concepts, a lot of the ideas, a lot of the culture for all of these Europeans were started back in the days of the Roman Empire, blended into their own uh, local cultures. So of course the French people are quite different than the English and so on, but there's some underlying basic ideas that were completely foreign to the Native Americans. Uh, so Native Americans would be basically more like, well, let's be reciprocal. We'll we meet you, we'll give you some gifts, you give us some gifts, we'll do that for a few years. We become, you develop a trading post, we're happy to do that. You need a little bit of land for a farm for your trading post. Okay, we'll agree to that. Maybe you give us some presents for that. Maybe we just decide to give it to you because we've had an awful lot of people die lately. And we don't know why, but now we don't have as many people anyway. So if you need some land, that's the kind of thing that went on uh, throughout the East and the Southeast at initial contact. Eventually what happened was uh, the Europeans would decide, um, you know, we've got people here we don't really like in England. We don't like these Quakers. They have a very weird religion. Uh, they're a kind of Protestant, but they're Protestant we don't like, you know, or maybe in some other part of the world, they have Catholics. Maybe they've got too many Catholics. We don't want you to be here anymore. They have people who have large families, six, eight, ten people in a family. The farm doesn't grow, but yet your family's grown. Well, maybe some of them could go to uh, America. And when they go to America, it's not yet the American government, but the, the continent of North America, they can go there and they could, you know, maybe they could work on a farm somewhere. Maybe they could start the trade or business um, and uh, get married. And then what happens is the colonists, because now we've moved from traders to colonists, the colonists end up having very large families. The average family had eight to 10 children. This means that you could be a local tribe that welcomes 40 or 50 colonists. And then in 20 years, now you've got 80 colonists and 40 years, you've got a couple hundred, another 10 or 20 years, there's hundreds and hundreds. And in the meantime, more and more ships are coming from all over Europe, bringing people to America. Just like right now on our Southern border, we have people who are coming into America. We have people who are flying in from Asia. We still have some Europeans coming to North America. Well, back then it was a steady stream. So they would come and they'd look for land and they'd be like, well, all the farms are taken. We don't really want to sell our farm. You know, go talk to those uh, Native Americans, those Indians. And so what would happen is the local governments would work with the Native peoples and say, well, why don't you, you know, you're not using it. You're just like hunting. You're not farming. Why don't you let us take some more of this land down there by the river? And, um, you know, we'll give you these presents. So we'll give you this money. And some of the Native American people would say, okay, you know, that sounds all right. And others would be like, you know, they keep moving in, moving in, moving in. What's going to happen when they take over everything? And they destroy things that we think are sacred. We don't like that. And they keep trying to make us go to their school or their church. And maybe we don't really want to. So there began to be conflict, as you've read about. And as you read more about as we go through the rest of the class. And as you see in the videos. So this conflict... Uh, you know, what kind of slowly creeped up, <laughs> if you will, the Native American people that started off with a very small number of, of traders. And then there's a small number of colonists who were really inept and most of them didn't have much in the way other than a few guns. And then the next thing you know, there's a large community that's well organized colonists and they have a small army and they uh, decide they want more and more land. So we're finally, we, we say, okay, we're gonna do a treaty with you, which is a promise between two different groups of people. We're gonna have this treaty. And when we get this treaty read, written up, then you European people won't go outside of this area and we'll get to have the other area. And since our population has been hugely decreased because of, your, of these diseases, um, you know, that might work out. Okay, let's stop for a second and talk about the diseases. So in the book, the author, uh, I, I've told you in an earlier video, I really want you to be intellectually uh, careful, critical thinker when you read and you watch things in movies and in books and on the internet. 
because a lot of what you hear and read about may be true or it may be not true or it may be true and the person's giving you almost inflammatory language to describe what happened. And um, I think it's a little unfortunate that the author of our text pretty much makes it sound like the Europeans thought, I know, let's bring smallpox to America. We'll have some Spanish people with smallpox come in and they'll uh, accidentally release some pigs, some horses and smallpox. And that will spread across North America really quickly. And the people who, um, you know, meet us, they won't even know what we're doing. That we're going to take over the whole continent this way. Well, that doesn't really work for a couple of different reasons, but let's go back to the pigs and horses. <laughs> the book doesn't really mention this, but the, the uh, Spanish, when they first came to Florida, did have pigs and horses, and some of them did get away, and some of them were able to do quite well spreading across the country. So eventually there were uh, some North American native peoples who found, you know, his horses showed up and maybe they had heard about the Spanish and their horses, but maybe not. And eventually they learned that these were domesticated animals that had only been recently freed because they were able to catch them and ride them and so on. And it became a huge important part of the Plains Indians uh, lifestyles to have these horses. It gave them a lot of power that you'll read about later, you'll hear about later. Um, and it, political power, economic power, war power. So the horses were important. Uh, the pigs ended up spreading everywhere. <laughs> it's another thing for people to eat. Um, and then the disease. So at the time of the Spanish, at the time of the English, the French, all of these colonists coming in, nobody knew what caused sickness. So you know it's caused by some kind of germ. Some of you know that those germs are typically called bacteria uh, or virus. So COVID is a virus. Um, there's also yeast, other kinds of things that can cause diseases and sicknesses, but mostly it's bacteria and virus. Both are so small, you can't see them unless you have a microscope. And even with the microscope, you might not be seeing the virus because it's very, very small. So, um, how did that idea come about when, as far as the sickness? Well, what happened was in the 1800s, mid 1800s, there's a guy named Louis Pasteur who discovered using microscopes and his own uh, problem solving analytical skills, he discovered that there were these little tiny animals. Uh, and in, in the case of what he was good at is bacteria. And he figured out that it wasn't just caused by the air. People used to think if you breathed bad air, then you would get sick. And then he figured out it's not the air. There's something in the air. There are these little creatures. He also figured out that if you cook things, that you can kill the bacteria. So when you have milk from the store in a bottle, you might notice it says pasteurized. Pasteurization comes from Pasteur, the scientist. So if it wasn't for him, <laughs> not only would most of us be dead because of all these diseases, but also even if you were to drink some milk, uh, there's a good chance that you could catch at some point in your life diseases from the cow. But instead, because it's pasteurized or cooked, uh, then it's safe, all right? But they didn't know that back then. English and French and all of these Russians, all of these people at that time, before Pasteur, they thought, and even after Pasteur, most people didn't know about this stuff. They didn't read about it, maybe until close to the 1900s. So they thought, well, it's caused by bad air. They thought, the Europeans thought, it's caused by the devil. The Native Americans thought it's caused by an imbalance between this person physically and spiritually, and what should be happening in nature. They've broken some sort of taboo or something else happened that threw them out of whack. It might have been caused even by these Europeans that showed up because the European would show up, sometimes a, even a missionary or a priest. And then after a while, all the people who were friendly with that person would be dead. And they'd think, well, there's something about that person that's out of balance. The other thing that both Europeans and the Native Americans thought is 
uh, the devil. There is some kind of witchcraft involved. And they became very suspicious uh, if somebody became sick, that somebody else was angry at them or were causing them some sort of disease. So this idea went on for a really long time, uh, pretty much all the way through the first couple of hundred years of contact uh, between the Native Americans, Europeans, and then later Americans once the American country, US country was started. So going back to the author, it kind of makes it sound like they made a plan to come in and kill all of the Native Americans um, using the disease. There were a few cases where army um, uh, officers decided to give smallpox patient uh, patients' blankets to Native Americans. And that did happen. But most, millions and millions and millions died, often with never seeing a European. The disease would spread across the country. And by the time the Europeans got there, there were hardly any people left, up to 90%. And although our class is not covering Hawaii, the same thing happened in Hawaii. The Hawaiians went uh, to the different islands, you know, about 800 years ago, 1,000 years ago. And when they first had contact about 300 years ago with Captain Cook and other sailors, 90% uh, of the Native Hawaiian people died. Um, and happily, the population has come back uh, quite a bit. But still, the island of Kauai, for example, used to have 400,000 people. Today, mostly people who are from mainland are there but there's only 100,000. But the island used to be able to support 400,000 with their um, uh, Polynesian cook, uh, farming methods. Okay, so let's go back to the, where we were as far as um, look, thinking about the Spanish coming through, um, them having soldiers, uh, the uh, way that they fought was different. So they marched across and they did end up killing, stealing, uh, sometimes raping, uh, making people into slaves, lots of bad things. Soto had been told by the king of Spain that he was to treat the native peoples in the South, South and North America kindly so that they would become Catholics. <laughs> but he didn't like that idea. He wanted gold. So he would torture and kill and do whatever he needed to do to try to find coal. And that did work in Peru. But in, in Southeast United States, there wasn't much gold as far as native people finding and keeping gold. Uh, he did dig up some graves and stole some pearls. Uh, and over the years, the author of our book says tens of thousands of people were killed. Uh, it might be as many as 5,000 were killed, some historians think, but it's a much smaller number than what our textbook says, uh, Native peoples being killed by the Spanish. Uh, most of the people that were killed by the Spanish were killed by the disease, not by the soldiers. And if you think about it, what they didn't go back to get more supplies. So they had to carry with them all of the bullets and black powder and so on that they were using for their whole uh, war effort. And that means that you wouldn't have been able, they wouldn't have been able to carry enough <laughs> ammunition and, and black powder to kill tens of thousands. Um, and that's part of what, you know, you need to kind of keep thinking about in your mind when you read these things and hear these things, what makes the most sense to you. Okay, so we've talked about a couple of different interesting things. I'm gonna look at my notes just here for a minute. All right, so I think one theme that we're gonna continue talking about just a little bit is that uh, once the native peoples made the treaties, then did the colonists of whichever, you know, Spanish, French, English, Americans, did they keep their promises? No, <laughs> they didn't, and why not? Well, there were two big reasons. One is that they felt that from their faith and their culture that they were uh, the most civilized, the most advanced, and that it was their uh, destiny to take over more land and to, uh, if possible, change Native Americans to make them like themselves. But if not, it's okay if they died or if their population shrank. That, that, that was all right. Uh, but the, the, this idea that our religion, our civilization is the best, is called ethnocentrism. And all cultures have this. They don't necessarily 
take the same actions, but they all think we're the best. For the native peoples, um, well, up here we've got a sand painting by uh, the Navajos. The Navajos call themselves the name. The name means the people. So they're the people. And then the Hopis, when this well, kachina next to it is the Hopi kachina, they weren't necessarily the people. <laughs> they were Hopis. They're okay, but they're not the people. So each culture thinks of themselves as being sort of the center and other cultures as being less important. And it takes uh, quite a bit of education and reflectiveness to be thinking, my culture is important, but it's not necessarily the only important culture or the most important culture. But back then, that is how people thought. It's how they were raised. So when the came to keeping the treaties, they thought, well, gosh, we're having eight or 10 kids uh, and our kids live longer because we uh, know some practices that make them stay a bit healthier. A lot of children died in, as, when they were small. A lot of mothers died in childbirth, but yet our population is growing and growing. And we are exporting our food, exporting cotton. We, some, in the South, they started to have slaves. Um, the Indians also had slaves. If they captured people from other tribes, they would become slaves but they started bringing in slaves from Africa. They had indentured servants. So one of my great, 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 great grandfathers uh, wanted to leave uh, uh, Ireland. And so he signed on for seven years to be a slave. And then at the end of that seven years, he was free to do what he wanted to do. <laughs> so there were lots of people who were working in these fields. Uh, it wasn't very nice, but they were raising tobacco, cotton and so on. And then these products would be sold overseas. And our government, the other European governments, the people who were landowners like Thomas Jefferson, they all wanted to have more and more land so that they could do these um, economic beneficial things for themselves and for their families. And what would eventually happen when they decided not to follow the treaties is they would try to make new treaties and then new treaties and new treaties as you've read. And sometimes the same tribe might end up making three or four treaties and then finally, the um, colonists would say, well, the government would say, we, we don't really want you to be here at all anymore. We want you to move to the new territory. So they would sometimes with force, sometimes with bribes, sometimes convincing people, they would get them to move. And uh, usually this was a forced march and many people would die because they wouldn't have enough food. They wouldn't have enough warm clothing. They wouldn't uh, be allowed to rest enough, they would get sick. And um, these uh, marches that happened to a number of different tribes, a lot of the tribes would usually be called the Trail of Tears, uh, that kind of, of, a, of a way of explaining it. It was very bad. And so um, when they moved to the new land, for example, Cherokees ended up uh, being moved to, mostly all of them got moved to Oklahoma, Sometimes the tribe would be there 50 years where people would be either a reservation where their land is protected or they would own land. And then um, the state government, usually not the federal government, the state government in Oklahoma, for example, decided, you know, we don't want that to be Indian lands anymore. We want to have people from the East move here, the people who are colonists or people who are Americans, and we want them to live here and we don't necessarily want the Indians to live here anymore. So then what space was left would be shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. And this happened all the way from where the Mohawks are located all the way to the Pacific Northwest. Um, the Alaskans have done better, the Alaska Native Americans, but almost everywhere else, the reservations would be shrunk and shrunk in size. And then uh, by the 1950s, 60s, uh, a lot of the smaller reservations were dissolved, including California, where some of the reservations were so small, they were called rancherias because they were small ranches left over from uh, the days of the Spanish and, and California's becoming a part of the United States and so on. And then happily, lately, some of those places have been reinstated. And that's why there's a casino, uh, the Grayton uh, Native American group has land that they bought in Willamette Park and the federal government recognized that as a kind of a small reservation. 
and they're able to operate a gambling uh, facility there. Um, so that eventually has kind of happened for some tribes. Uh, other tribes have no land at all. So I'm not really telling you the end of the story. The story keeps happening as you read about what happened in the Northeast, the Southeast. You're going to be learning about the Plains and the and uh, west and so on, all the way across the country, because the population of Europeans came first to, um, well, Soto came through uh, Florida and, and went around, and, and the French down in the south, but then later up in the northeast, the other Europeans came and landed, and then slowly but steadily moved all the way across the country in a very determined way. So as far back as Thomas Jefferson sending Lewis and Clark across the country, he wanted to know what is on this continent? Who's there? How many of them are there? And then from that point forward, the United States is, as government has gradually uh, decided it's going to have what we call manifest destiny of the entire continent being part of that government. Uh, so we've talked a long time and probably a bit more than I needed to tell you uh, for this particular uh, lecture, but I wanted you to understand a, sort of the big picture that sometimes you start to get in the book because you keep, did I already read that? Well, no, that happened with another tribe, but the same thing's happening again. So I wanted you to have the big picture of what's been going on as far as um, uh, Native Americans losing their land, uh, disease, um, and where some of the original ideas came from that led the Europeans to act the way they did, which goes all the way back to the days of the Romans, uh, 2,000 years ago. And their empire lasted a 1,000 years. So these ideas uh, uh, showed that they, whether they're right or wrong, they worked for um, a, a large part of uh, Europe and um, uh, Middle East for a very long time. All right, so that's all for now. Thank you very much. If you're, again, as usual, if you have any questions, send me an email. Uh, please don't post questions to the website and I look forward to seeing you online. Thank you.